He says, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. He doesn't say, I gave you a king in my grace and I took him away in my wrath. <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Oh, okay, they gave him. Yeah, they gave him Saul. They gave him other kings, right? God would both give and take away in his anger. We, we tend to assume that everything that we think is good from God was, was like a great gift. Not always. Not always. So we are drawing uh, to, a, to a bit of a close in our study in Hosea. We'll be hopefully finishing the end of chapter 13 this evening. And when we began this series all too long ago, I hate to think when we started this series, uh, it wasn't meant to go this long, but uh, we talked about how Hosea has been called the strangest story in the Bible. The strangest story in the Bible that, that God will commend or command one of the like one of the good guys, yeah, one of the prophets to to uh, to marry someone who would, you know, later prove to be unfaithful. Uh, very, very strange. Many strange things in the Bible. This command of the Lord is certainly one of them. But then Hosea has been called, on the other hand, the second greatest story in the Bible, maybe the second greatest love story in the Bible of Hosea, of course, going and buying back uh, his, his wife. Of course, one of the other lesser or, or, or as great a story would be uh, Abraham offering his son. That's another kind of demonstration of, of sacrificial love outside of the cross of Christ. The key verse of Hosea is Hosea 2.20, I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. God would take hold of his covenant people who had been stained by unfaithfulness and he would take them again. He would do so forever. Uh, and it was this, this gospel in miniature what, what Hosea does to his bride, God is going to do to his people. Uh, and that God was willing to uh, allow his servant to, to endure some hard things. I couldn't think much harder than what he went through. To teach this pictorial lesson to an entire nation. The other point we made when we began the series was that Hosea had a very long ministry very long ministry, he could have ministered uh, as many as 60 years, 60 years. Or in the last quarter of the Old Testament. And it seems to me when you look at the contents of the book of Hosea, that, that what the prophet wrote concerning himself, fulfilled, but concerning the nation, unfulfilled unfulfilled uh, he would uh, he would not minister in pleasant times Israel is in a very bad situation spiritually speaking and so uh, Hosea like God's people are going to have to wait for God to act at a future time there's uh, something really unfulfilled about the ministry of the Old Testament prophets now we come to verse 9 of Hosea 13, and you have this, uh, this, this cry of anguish of God. O oh, Israel, you are destroyed. He, he is looking over what's going to be carnage. But, he says, your help is from me. Now, the second part of verse 9 sounds very positive. Your help is from me, but the problem is that I want the help. I want the help. So there's a, there's a solution, but it's not going to get received. It's not going to get received. Israel have put themselves in an impossible situation. There's help, but that would mean that they had to turn around they'd have to change their ways and because they declined 
God declines to rescue them. God will do that. God doesn't twist people's arms. He says, I want to show mercy to you. I want to reach out to you, forgive you, restore you. But you need to come to me. My help is, my, your help is from me. I'm the source. But when they or we put ourselves, when we kind of corner ourselves, you know, we corner ourselves. And humility is the only next step. We make things harder. And then, of course, you have this irony that springs from verse 9 is Israel's would-be helper is going to be her destroyer. God is going to superintend over the Assyrians coming in to defeat. He's going to do it again through the Babylonians with with. Judah, that precious tribe of the southern kingdom, Hosea was a northern kingdom prophet alongside Jonah. Uh, all the other prophets were southern kingdom prophets. But the irony is that the helper would become her ultimate destroyer. Now in verse 10 and 11 of Hosea 13, uh, this, this, this concept of, of, of king comes up. God would be their king, but they want their own. They'll look elsewhere. God would be her sovereign. However, they're going to look everywhere else in every place to find an earthly king who, in the final analysis, didn't really help them any way. If you look at verse 10, I'll be your king. Where is any other? Well, you look at the chronologies. There's, there, there's a load of, 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 of kings out of the north, but they just keep getting, you know, deposed, <laughs> defeated, assassinated. These, these kings are dropping like flies, like flies. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes? You look to the noble families and what, what did they do for you? Not much, not much. Now, with that thought in mind, uh, keep a bookmark in Hosea 13 and I want you to turn over to Matthew 23. We're going to be in Matthew 23 just a couple of times this evening, Matthew 23, because Jesus, in Matthew 23, has a similar word for the generation that he ministered to while he was on the earth. He says in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. In effect, he says, I'll be your king. I'll be your king. I'll gather you like a hen caring for her chicks under her wings. I'm offering you protection. Protection. But you were not willing. But Jesus does hold up hope because he says in verse in verse 39, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say. Right? There's a glimmer of hope. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus speaks here as prophet in Matthew 23 and says, I'm here for you. I'm your helper. But you're not asking. And I, I did a few years of miracles and... I mean, I've demonstrated who I am. There's no doubt about who I am. Well, what's your response going to be? Right? So, again, keep Matthew 23 open. If you go to verse 11 of, of Hosea 13, he says, He says, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. He doesn't say, I gave you a king in my grace and I took him away in my wrath. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Oh, okay, they gave him. Yeah, they gave him Saul. They gave him other kings, right? God would both give and take away in his anger. 
not every, you know, not, you know we, we tend to assume that every, you know, everything that we think is good from God was, was like a great gift. Not always. Not always. God would give and take away in his anger. What God gave them was not necessarily a mark of his approval, right? Just because they got it doesn't mean that this was best for them. It wasn't best for them. It wasn't a great turn of events in 1 Samuel when the people grab Samuel by the collar and say, give us a king like everyone else. It wasn't a great mark. It wasn't a great day. Well, God granted them the request. He did. But it wasn't, it wasn't good for them in that sense. In that sense, the Lord removed the kings that followed because they had continued in the pattern of those previous kings who would not obey the Lord. So God's gifting and his taking were both expressions of his displeasure not his approval and so uh, we just got to take whatever God gives us right with a grain of salt and you know maybe a clear answer to prayer but but I, I know from my own you know mistakes that there are times when I just really wanted a certain thing and and look, yeah it happened but not good not good not a good not a good turn of events you yeah? know not a good turn of events so let's learn from those things look at verse 12 of Hosea 13 then we'll go back to Matthew 23 he says the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up so there's a binding up of 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 sin and then it says his sin is stored up is stored up you know th think about those temporary places where you um leave your furniture and valuables and things in those storage places just just something stored up for a year or two whatever it is the 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 sins of god's people were like a were like a a a, a, a scroll that had been tied and all the contents were secure not going anywhere or stored up like like treasure okay with that in mind with that in mind again go back to matthew 23 Jesus here speaks as prophet, but we'll go up a couple of verses to 34, 34 of, of Matthew 23. He says, therefore, indeed, I'll send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Now that includes Hosea. <laughs> that includes Hosea. Some of them you'll kill and crucify and some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on, on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus said, all these things are going to come upon this generation. Jesus says, listen, when you reject me, right, it's not just my words that, that you're going to get judged for rejecting. It's going to be the cumulative witness of, of, of the prophets before because they spoke about me. They testified of me. And so when, 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 people re when the Jewish people rejected Jesus, it wasn't so much only his word and his miracles, but it was all of the prophets before him that talked about Messiah. All these things are going to come on you. The sin is stored. The iniquity is bound up. Uh, now, I, you know, I know you keep abreast of world events and things, and it, it has been interesting the last few weeks watching, uh, watching Israel uh, take steps to get their residents back along the northern border neighboring Lebanon. There's about 60,000, 70,000 residents that... that have moved you know they're living in airbnb they're living in hotels they're living right they can't remain on the border up to that point israeli farmers they they would till their ground to the to the border the border yeah 
because otherwise you're just sacrificing territory. And some of you have seen those clips where, where Israel have found some, some villages, Lebanese villages, where a number of homes are storing, stockpiling weapons, right? And you see on the clip, you see this initial strike, the strike, the, 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 the bomb, whatever you want to call it, bombing those houses full of munitions, and then these, these almighty bombs falling after, yeah? You've got the strike, then you've got bomb, 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 bomb. In, you know, really incredible to see. Those, you know, it's foolish people. And, and, you know, maybe some were under duress. I don't know. I don't know. But in, in, storing, in storing those weapons, you know, month after month, year after year, that became the point of their own destruction. All they had to do was drop a bomb on them and those missiles meant for Israel were going to be for whoever was left there and, you know, tragically, you know, how these things end. But it's not a bad picture of, 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 of sin being stored up. Uh, we, we witnessed, you know, that, 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 the, the, the remarkable story of those hundreds and hundreds of, of pages exploding in people's faces. You know, looking, waiting for the next set of instructions from the terrorists and then and then and then pictures of those I saw pictures of those terrorists that had been that had been flown to Iran flown to Iran there at the temples you know faces covered hands covered fingers missing you know seeking some kind of blessing I mean it's pretty sick to see pretty sick to see but what what an interesting example of of uh, punishment at the source punishment in the very act of, of violence. Uh, well, that's that won't be the last time people are going to be confronted with their own actions and responsibility. God says in verse 12 that the iniquity of Eph Ephraim is bound up, her sin is stored up. It's not going anywhere, it's not going to leak out, it's not going to disappear, right? It's not going to get cleared off the hard drive of God's memory. It's going to stay there, it'll be there. Not going anywhere. God's time. And the nation here is compared in verse 13 to, 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 to a child. A child who will not leave the mother's womb. Now, I, I should have done a bit more research on, on that. But, but, you know, as I understand, the, when, when a woman is, is ready to have, have that baby, there are contractions and there are all these things happening. It's, uh, it, it, it's not so much about the, 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 the intention of the baby, I don't think. There's no room anymore. You know, God's made it so that child is going gonna, is gonna to have to come. Um, or, or doctors are going to get involved pretty quick smart if there are complications and all those sorts of things. Right? But here you have this image of a baby that won't come out of its mother's womb. It's refusing to leave its comfortable surroundings. God's people want to remain exactly where they are, but it's going to kill them. It's going to destroy them if they don't move and go. Now, verse 13, sorry, verse 14 of Hosea chapter 13 is an interesting one. It's an interesting one because of how we read it, how we read it. And, and what's even more challenging is that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 quotes this verse he quotes it so then the question is um, is what Paul had in mind when he quotes this verse is, is that what it fully intends to mean you know? uh, in the New Testament the writers will often take what was said in the Old Testament even a direct quotation or a paraphrase but but just from kind of one angle not 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 the whole explanation all right uh, we know that, that, that out of Egypt, God called his son Israel, but then Matthew uses that to talk about Jesus uh, coming out of Egypt. But it's a secondary, though ultimate, uh, promise. But look at verse 14 of, of Hosea 13. He says, I, I, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I'll redeem them from death. This sounds really awesome. It sounds really good. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But the thing is that this, this has been read by 
those who know Hebrew much better than me, as God asked himself rhetorically, will I ransom them from the power of the grave? Will I redeem them from death? Will God do it? Because you know, see how verse 14 ends. Pity is hidden from my eyes. So the northern kingdom are not going to enjoy any kind of ransom or redemption. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I mean, that's the point of Hosea's prophecy. The, the Assyrians are coming. They're on their way. The judgment is sure. But then you have this middle part of verse 14. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. He, he appeals for death to torment the northern kingdom. Like thorns tearing flesh. He calls on the grave to sting them fatally. So this is ultimately a call for judgment. But then, but then Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, in the, in the interest of time, uh, let me just read to you 1 Corinthians uh, 15 from 54, um, where, where, where Paul talks about the resurrection. When this corruptible shall put on incorruption, the resurrected body, and this mortal will put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Then he quotes Hosea 13. He says, O death, where is thy sting? It's a question. Where is it? O, o, o Hardies or O grave, where is your victory? Death, where's your sting? Grave, where is your victory? And then he applies it to what Jesus will do through his own death, burial, and resurrection. The northern kingdom won't enjoy this redemption. But God's people who put their faith and trust in Christ will be redeemed. They will escape the grave. The grave won't be the last word. God has a glorious future beyond punishment for human sin. Which he, which he enacted on his son, his son at Calvary. And so Hosea promises that, that, that Israel would indeed suffer death and the grave. Yep, absolutely. She ain't going to escape. But then Paul shows us that through Jesus' resurrection, that he can overcome the judgment and death that are inevitable. For sinners. And so there are these tricky verses in, 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 in the Old Testament because the, the, the New Testament writers, tend, they kind of use them differently to how they first appear in the Old Testament. It's very challenging, very challenging. So last verse in the time that we have today, last verse of Hosea 13, Hosea 13 Though he is fruitful among his brethren. Now, that sounds like what God said about Joseph at the end of Genesis. Joseph, a fruitful bow. Joseph. Look, this northern kingdom had so much promise. Look what it says. An east wing wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness. Now, this is... This is seen as a prophecy about the Assyrians. But it's called the wind of the Lord. Why? Because unless God allows this, it's not going to happen. There is people. Unless God allows it, it's not going to happen. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, then his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Just like when you go and you get, you go up to uh, the fellowship lunch and you get the best chicken pieces. Ooh, you get the best dessert. Oh yeah, 
you, you get the best. You're under that table and you pick the best. Well, that's what the Assyrians are gonna to do to, to the Northern Kingdom. They're coming and they're gonna get their hands on the best of everything. And they're gonna take it free of charge, free. This east wind. Remember when, remember how Jonah ends and he, he makes a shelter in the shade. He sees what's gonna become of the city, remember that? And God plants, prepared a plant that, that is gonna give shade to his head because he's miserable and Jonah's very happy about that. And then the morning comes, God prepares a worm and it's so damaged the plant that it withers, right? And what happens the next day? It says the sun arose and God prepared a vehement east wind. A vehement east wind. Something similar here, an east wind shall come. Jonah's the other prophet to the northern kingdom. Hosea's the, the other prophet, just Hosea and Jonah. Well, you have an east wind coming to Jonah. And you know what happened when this east wind comes? It beats on his head so that he grew faint. And he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Just those hours, just those hours of that sun arising in Jonah chapter 4. God's going to take away all their comfort. He's going to take away all the good things of their former life. And the Assyrians are on their way. They're going to plunder everything valuable in the land. Invaders in the Bible, when they came, they, they were under no obligation to do anything other than to plunder. Take what they wanted, take who they wanted. Unless the king, you know, got his dibs on what he wanted first, yeah? The king had his own wish list of what he was going to take and who he was going to take. Then everyone else got what was left. Uh, this was a brutal business. This was a brutal business, conquering and overtaking. But it says the wind of the Lord shall come. The northern kingdom weren't unlucky. They weren't unlucky. They were disobedient. They were disobedient. They spurned a the help that was offered to them graciously by God. So we're going to end things there. Verse 16 is apparently actually part of chapter 14 in the Hebrew Bible. So we'll leave the last verse to next message, treating that with chapter 14.